Okay, hello and welcome all. My name is Marie-Claude Cote from Canada. I'm currently on leave from Library and Archives Canada. I'm pleased to moderate the fourth panel session of this uh, My 2021 virtual conference. This panel will focus on metadata and gender and sexual diversity, a topic that has never been presented before in a DCMI conference, and I'm so thrilled. A word of caution, the topic of gender and sexual identities, orientations, and expressions may be touchy for some people. I invite all of us to remain open-minded and respectful. Also, you may hear different acronyms during the upcoming presentations to describe the spectrum of gender and sex and sexually diverse persons. For example, I will use the acronym LGBTQ+, which stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning or queer, and plus, and more. Speakers may use other acronyms. In all cases, rest assured that we mean to encompass all the terms that respectfully describe individuals we don't identify as cisgender and heterosexual. So now that we're all on the same page, I want to mention to not hesitate to tweet about the panel using the hashtag DCMI2021. We have quite an amazing lineup of, of speakers today. Our first speakers will be Amber Gillet, Systems and Metadata Librarian at Bard College. Amber will introduce us to the Homozorus, a linked data vocabulary for the LGBTQ plus community. Our second speaker will be Claire Cronk, Biomedical Informatician and Postdoctoral Fellow at the Yale Center for Medical Informatics. Our presentation is entitled A Fundamental Clinical Skill, the Gender, Sex, and Sexual Orientation, GSSO, Ontology, and Facilitating Communications in Healthcare. We will continue with Rachel Clark and Sayard Schoonmaker. Rachel is Assistant Professor at the Syracuse University School of Information Studies. Sayard is the artistic director of the Stone Quarry Hill Art Park in Casanova, New York. Their presentation is called The Critical Catalog, using a design prototype to address problematic metadata. Our last but not least speaker will be John Samuel, associate professor at the CPE Lyon in France. John will share with us about modeling and documenting queer voices and topics on Wikidata. I invite you to consult the conference website for full details about our speakers for the session summary and to watch a replay of this session. Here is how I will conduct the panel. Speakers will present one after another for roughly 80 minutes or so. The question and answer period will follow right after for the remaining time of the session. I encourage you to send your questions as they come using the Zoom chat function and I will read them on your behalf. As for sending your questions, there are two options. You can send to all participants or to hosts and speakers. Make sure to send your questions to all participants. Use the host and speakers option only to communicate technical issues with the Zoom platform. Okay, so without further ado, go back to Zoom, arrêtez. Super. Without further ado, let's welcome Amber Billy. Amber, you have the honor to break the ice. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mary Claude. Um, let me share my screen. And let me begin the presentation. Go. All right, can you all see my presentation? Yes. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you all for having me um, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, wherever you may be. It is my pleasure to introduce the Homosaurus to you all today. A linked data vocabulary for the LGBTQ 
plus community. My name is Amber Billy, and I'm a librarian at Bard College, and it's my pleasure to be here with you all today. So before I begin, I just want to make some basic assumptions that kind of lay the groundwork for what I'm going to be talking about today and what all of us on the panel will be talking about today, and that we all accept that sexuality is a spectrum, that gender is a spectrum, and that the LGBTQ community is a dynamic and ever-changing uh, community, and that the LGBT community and its members should have a self-determination of their lexicon. Now, I bring this up because in the years that I've been presenting on this topic, um, I used to have to give many slides to explain that sexuality is a spectrum, that gender is a construct. And it just is, brings me so much joy that I can just have one slide that we can make these basic assumptions and then we can, we can move on with um, actually presenting the work that we're doing. So with that, let's begin to explore um, why, we, why, we came, why the Homosaurus came to be. So many entity management platforms and name authorities allow catalogers and uh, data, metadata creators to record gender and sexuality for people. And however, a person's gender may change over time or their sexuality may change over time, over the course of their, over the course of their lifetime, several times. And it also may fall beyond the binary. Where traditional controlled vocabularies lack terminology for, um, to describe the diversity of gender and sexuality for the LGBTQ community, there was a need to create a thesaurus that would enable um, accurately describing people that fall outside the, the gender binary, that have uh, gender and sexual diversity. And so there was a real need within the metadata management community to address this issue. So the solution was to create and maintain an open link data thesaurus for the worldwide LGBTQ plus community. And I like to say it's maintained us by, it's maintained by us for everyone. And it's an open platform. So you know, everyone can, can see what we're building and what we're doing, but it's a constantly changing and growing to meet the needs of our community. So the mission of the Homosaurus is that it is an international link data vocabulary of the LGBT, of LGBTQ terms that support that supports improved access to LGBTQ plus resources within cultural institutions, such as museums, libraries, archives. It's designed to serve as a companion to broad subject term vocabularies. Um, the, in the Homosaurus is a robust and cutting edge vocabulary of LGBTQ specific terminology that enhances discoverability of LGBTQ resources. So when I say that it's a companion, to broad subject term vocabularies, what I mean is that it, it works in addition or in companion to subject um, vocabularies such as the Library of Congress, uh, subject headings, um, or um, uh, even Wikidata or um, the Art and Architecture Thesaurus, um, any large broad subject term vocabulary, the Homosaurus is there designed by the LGBTQ community for all to use in companion with these larger broad subject term vocabularies. Uh, you can find it at homosaurus.org. And it is an open linked data vocabulary with stable URIs uh, where you can use and reuse within your metadata. So this, the Homosaurus surprisingly has a long history. It began in the Netherlands at the Ilia archives in 1982. Um, it started simply as a very basic paper thesaurus to use as a subject access um, to the collections there at Ilia. It was revised a few times in the 90s and the early 2000s. But then in 2015, it became a linked data vocabulary and it was taken on by the Digital Transgender Archives. In 2016, an editorial board was established and that's when I joined the editorial board. Um, it's a wild to me that it's been since 2016, um, but it's, and it's grown so much since then. So in 2019, 
so in those three years, the board met, we looked at uh, what we were given by Elia, and we made it more specific to the LGBTQ community. When we received it from Elia, it was a very broad, it was a, it was a uh, vocabulary that really tried to uh, encompass uh, uh, everything, organize almost everything, but with a, a, a slant to the LGBTQ community. And we decided to narrow that scope so that it was really only just LGBTQ plus uh, uh, terminology. Um, and with that, we've been able to broaden certain areas, narrow certain areas, and really hone into what we were trying to describe to provide access to collections of LGBTQ resources. So we launched version 2.0 in 2019 as exclusively a queer vocabulary. And in 2021, so this year, we received a significant grant to expand and further develop the vocabulary. And what's exciting about this is that we've been able to hire actually a, a staff, a, a PhD student, a staff member, and it's wonderful what you can do when you have some paid labor. <laughs> and and uh, we've been able to take board retreats and, and we're, we're really targeting specific branches of the, of the of the thesaurus for further development. Um, and we're really looking at how to um, make this a sustainable project in the long run. So let's take a quick look at controlled vocabularies. For those of you who are not familiar with controlled vocabularies, these are, um, the controlled vocabularies allow for metadata consistency that allow for access to um, resources based on a controlled term. So here is a basic thesaurus construction where you have the primary term in the center. Uh, we have broader terms and narrower terms that either open up the vocabulary to broader concepts or narrower um, terms to more specific concepts. We also have related terms and these might be, they're, not, they're neither broader or narrow, but they are related to the primary term that you're referencing. In, our, in a thesaurus, you have use for terms and these are not the preferred term. These are other terms that might be uh, associated with this concept, but you choose a preferred term and that links back to the primary term here in the center. Um, but you can of course reference those used or use for terms. And then we have scope notes in the homosaurus. Um, scope notes are useful for usage, definitions, um, and just overall uh, how to apply this term when considering using it in, in your metadata. So what does the homosaurus do? It really provides expanded possibilities for the queer lexicon and culture. So, you know, here I'm, I'm a butch woman, I identify as a butch woman. And according to the Library of Congress subject headings, I don't really exist. I would only exist within the butch femme relationship of lesbian culture. So only within companionship of my femme counterpoint do I exist. And the broader term is then lesbian culture. Now, LCSH has butch dogs, but I'm certainly not a dog. Now, the homosaurus, while it has butch femme relationships that would be an equivalent to the LCSH term, um, we have more specific terms that actually would more accurately describe my identity. So we have related terms of femmes, stone butches, butches, uh, role behavior, sexual identity, and broader terms of um, relationships, LGBTQ, and broader term lesbian culture. So you start to build these nuances within the queer lexicon that at more accurately describe our culture, but more importantly can accurately describe the persons or the concepts or the resources that you're describing in your collections. We also have more specificity for intersectional queer, queer identity. When you look at how LCSH deals with intersectional um, queer identity with race and ethnicity, it's inconsistent. Um, you know, sometimes we see on, on uh, with LCSH, you know, it's, uh, they, they say gays, gay men, lesbians, and then they'll have the race and ethnicity. But in other situations, they'll have the race and ethnicity, and then it'll say gay, gay men, or lesbians. And it's, it's just that inconsistency is not, it's not very useful for um, user experience. So in the homosaurus, we allow for greater specificity. Under the broader term LGBTQ ethnic groups, we have many narrower terms. So narrower term people of color LGBTQ. And it should be noted that um, in the latest uh, edition of uh, latest updates of the homosaurus, uh, we are gonna be, we're gonna be changing 
how we describe this concept of uh, parentheses LGBTQ, and we're going to be removing those parentheses just to make it LGBTQ people of color, and then it'll, and then then further narrower terms of you know lesbian people of color, gay people of color, bisexual people of color, transgender people of color, and trans people of color, and it'll go, and you can have that specificity for all these different ethnicities and and races. Um, so we allow for this intersectional queer identity with such a nice granular level of specificity um, to really accurately describe uh, the people and the concepts for, for the resources that you have in your collections. We continue with um, spiritual queer identity. So, you know, this is just another example. So, you know, Library of Congress simply just has Buddhist gays, broader term gays. Um, whereas in the Homosaurus, you know, in our in a, a, it, within Buddhists LGBTQ, and again, that's going to be flipped to LGBTQ Buddhists. Um, and I, I didn't switch, I didn't update my slides because it's not quite there yet. We're it's going to take some time for for this change. We just voted on on this term, this change like last Friday. So this is a very dynamic thesaurus. Um, so, uh, so. We have Buddhist LGBTQ, soon to be LGBTQ Buddhists, and then you can go uh, queer Buddhist, bisexual Buddhist, gay Buddhist, transgender Buddhist, lesbian Buddhist, and then LGBTQ religions would be the broader term. So we just continue to have these expanded possibilities to model, uh, you know, the queer existence in in the in the greater world. So let's take a look at. Um, gender specifically. And this, this really goes into how we can have a granular, granular, granular level of specificity to describe gender diversity. So in the LCDGT, so the Library of Congress demographic group terms, they have the broader or gathering term gender minorities. And under that we have intersex people, transgender people, transsexuals, and I would argue uh, inaccurately transvestites. Um, and then in the Homosaurus, under the broad term uh, LGBTQ people, we have transgender people. And you can see just how many uh, terms we have for ge gender variant, gender non-binary uh, individuals um, under transgender people. And this is really, I couldn't fit all of this on the slide. Um, here, I will pop out and we can take a look at this in the Homosaurus. And you can see how it's organized here where we have the stable URI and we have the preferred label, we have alternative labels, so the use for, we have a brief description or what is considered the scope note, the identifier, um, some provenance metadata, um, and we have external ID matches to, and right now we're matching to uh, id.loc.gov, so Library of Congress's linked data service. And then we can go into broader terms, related terms, narrower terms, and we then go into uh, the hierarchy display. Uh, okay. So let's take a look at this a little more closely in a, in a graph format. So we can see how we can really model this concept of transgender people and the accuracy, accuracy that we can use to describe these individuals and the complexity of these identities and the specificity of these identities to facilitate the respect that these individuals um, deserve. So rather than just lumping all transgender people under this umbrella term, if an individual that you're describing uses a more specific term, then use the terms that we have here in the Homosaurus, and we have these available for you to use in your metadata. So let's take a look at how this works in practice. So I have a little bit of MARC code here. So for those of you who are familiar with MARC cataloging, I'm a librarian, I'm a catalog librarian. So this is a, a record that I created recently for a beautiful artist book um, called Transitioning on 63 Cents a Day um, by, by the artist, um, uh, oh, of course, uh, let me pop this out real quick, uh, by, the, by the artist Leopoldo Bloom. Um, and this is my beautiful little mark record on, on, in my catalog here at Bard. Um, and so this book is about this artist's transition um, on 63 cents a day during their time in Portland. And the artist book is, is 
a series of postcards written to their mother in a, in a canister, in a film canister. And so, you know, the Library of Congress subject heading terms for these, uh, while were very pretty good, um, I felt like I really wanted to bring out some of the more specificity about this resource. So being able to describe FTMs, trans men, transitioning, mothers of transgender people, and then specifically transgender artists, those were some terms that I, I felt were more specific that would be more applicable and bring, bring out that resource a little bit more. And so you can see here in Mark Coding, you can use the um, thesaurus designator in the subfield too. You can use homo it or homo IT or homo saurus international thesaurus. And I just kind of love that I can just homo it and, um, and use these terms. So here is um, an example of what this would look like using linked data in, um, this is an OCLC's uh, cataloging utility connection. Uh, so here you can use the subfield zero uh, for controlled vocabularies and ap apply those URIs to each of those um, six, each of those 650 subject fields. And because this is the Dublin Core metadata initiative, I of course had to put a little bit of Dublin Core in here. So here is some uh, Dublin Core in XML where you can describe the vocabulary encoding scheme as the attribute for these elements of these subject elements. So, and here, you know, here's just an example of um, what it would look like or what we're linking to. So by providing these URIs uh, for, for here specifically trans men, we can link to, you know, the trans men, the concept in the homosaurus. And so that brings together from a linked data perspective, all these, uh, all these resources that, that describe trans men. So let's, and, and this is where linked data becomes incredibly important because as we describe these resources um, and we use linked data and these resources get published as open linked data, we never know where this data is gonna go. So as we publish it, as it gets reused, repurposed, if we use these stable URLs, then we all are linking to these concepts that we all agree on. So this becomes an issue when we start describing people um, and we're using terms that perhaps they might not use themselves. And this can have reverberations as we use, as, as linked data gets published. So here's an example of the author, Patrick Califia, who was assigned female at birth and later transitioned to male later in life. Uh, before they transitioned, they wrote extensively on a, on a wide variety of subjects, primarily about lesbian culture and sexuality. Um, and here in their Library of Congress name authority record, uh, the cataloger chose to describe to to use females, males, trend, transgender people, and here describing you know, her sophistry, his sensual magic, um, and just really, really describing this person's gender in ways that don't accurately reflect them as they, current, as they currently identify. So I propose that we could make, this, make a change, an update to Patrick Califia's um, authority record that would more accurately and more respectfully describe them so here, just simply removing uh, all the gender, uh, gendered terms and using the homosaurus and just describing them as they describe themselves as a trans man, uh, using the word trans men and removing those um, pronouns. Those pronouns are completely unnecessary. So I wanna give some best practices for when describing gender and sexuality in, in, in uh, describing your resources with metadata with your metadata. And I would argue to say generally don't record gender unless the person explicitly and publicly states their gender identity. But for the most part, I would argue don't record gender. Why is gender, think about critically, why is gender necessary when describing a person or describing the resources in your collection? And if you do record gender, use the words that the person uses to describe themselves. And this is where the homosaurus can be incredibly useful for you if, if a person falls outside the gender binary. Um, and then select a term from a controlled vocabulary, such as the homosaurus. And then I say, when in doubt, leave it out. If you're unsure, then it's not necessary. So I want to shout out to the editorial board, my other editorial board members, and Claire Cronk is actually who's speaking soon um, is on the board as well. But I want to thank uh, Marika Seifor, Jay Colbert, uh, Janea Kizzi, uh, Chloe, Chloe Nolan, uh, KJ Rowland, uh, Bree Watson, Jack Vanderwell, and Andrian Williams. 
Um, and thank you very much. If you uh, like this beautiful logo that we have, you can purchase a mug or a t-shirt and it will benefit the Homosaurus if you just go to homosaurus.threadless.com. And again, it's my pleasure to introduce this fabulous little amazing uh, thesaurus to you all today. Thank you. Well, thank you, Amber. Um, so you mentioned in 2021, you just received a grant, so you could hire a person to, uh, to, to work on it. So this, this means that all the work has been done so far on a volunteer basis? Yes. Oh my, wow. <laughs> That's impressive. <laughs> That's really impressive. Um, wow. There has, and, uh, there, there has been a there has uh, there has been a programmer that's been involved who was uh, or is part of the Digital Transgender Archive, and and the Digital Transgender Archive has some has funding, and I, I believe that that's how a lot of the the uh, in the technological infrastructure to the Homosaurus was um, was supported. So through our partnership with the Digital Transgender Archives and the funding there. But, um, but it's only been recently that the Homo Soros was given independent funding. Well, I have to say that uh, it's the best logo uh, I've seen in a long time. I really love it. I think I'm going to order a mug. <laughs> Thank you again, Amber. Let's, not, let's now welcome our second speaker, Claire Kronk. Claire, I pass you the baton. Oh, thank you very much. Um... Let me see if that's working. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I will say if you do also like the Homosaurus's um, structure generally, its backend is built on Ruby on Rails using a database framework that's super easy to use. So if you're looking at setting up something like that yourself, it's definitely possible. Um, but hi, I'm Claire Kronk, uh, and today I'm going to be presenting on a fundamental clinical skill, the gender, sex, and sexual orientation ontology, and facilitating communication in healthcare. So about me, pre like, I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow at Yale University. My thesis focused on building the GSSO, um, which is a vocabulary of over 14,000 LGBTQI plus and related terms. So we're a little bit broader than the homosaurus in scope as we include, um, for instance, like sex work terms, pornographic terms, and broader, um, just generally like sex, sexual orientation and gender related terminology. Um, the terminology has been used uh, as I've been consulting with Canada Health InfoWay, DICOM, it's digital imaging in medical field, uh, HL7, which is a messaging standard for medical, uh, messaging systems, the Mayo Clinic, Merck, uh, the National Academy of Sciences, our history, Queensland Health, and SNOMED CT, which is the systematized nomenclature of medicine. I'm also a board member of the Home Stores with Billy, uh, and I've been working briefly with the Trans Metadata Collective and the AMIA Inclusive Language Guidelines Task Force, and that's the American Medical Informatics Association. So I came to uh, the idea that I should build a terminology or an ontology simply because there were a lot of factors that were really happening in the United States and in the world and still are, but this was back in 2018. Um, and so we were looking at a number of, and we still are looking at a number of anti-LGBTQ related laws and bills that have been passed um, or are being considered. And when you talk to individual people about their healthcare experiences, and I will say like, nobody likes, <laughs> Like being objectified by a medical provider, it's not just LGBTQI plus people. Um, I constantly talk to people outside of that group who also feel that um, certain medical providers might not treat them as a full human being in a number of respects, which can be extremely dehumanizing. And when it comes to language specifically, um, we see language barriers in terms of dialect, in terms of understanding how intensity of various terms, uh, how medicine is kind of gendered in that respect. So uh, if a woman says she's in pain versus if a man says he's in pain with the exact same words, they might be treated completely differently by, by the same provider, which is obviously not acceptable. <laughs> um, but when you look into the LGBTQI community specifically, we see that there's a lot of this history of pathologization and medicalization specifically through um, two terminology systems called the International Classification of Diseases, which is maintained by the World Health Organization, 
and the DSM, so it's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is um, maintained by the APA. Um, despite being an American uh, terminology, it is exported uh, to basically everywhere on earth for psychiatric practice, which in my opinion is a form of medical colonialism, but you can ask me about that later if you're interested. Um, so these are two specific quotes that really speak to me in this regard of how no matter how hard uh, providers were trying as allies, sometimes sites would set themselves up to look really great, but hide more sinister purposes. Um, there would be times when somebody says, oh, I'm a, a really big ally and I'm so great. And then they run a conversion therapy clinic behind the scenes. And so people, providers would just feel really much like they were drowning, um, not knowing who the experts were, who to send to people. There weren't training and education programs and for the most part, there still aren't. Additionally, as language updates for a number of various um, social and behavioral reasons, um, it becomes kind of intractable to keep up. And so we wanted to develop the gender, sex, and sexual orientation ontology, incorporating, kind of bridging this gap mainly, and just saying, how can we showcase the move from in-group terminology to out-group terminology by capturing that middle sort of uh, semi-translatability, um, which required uh, obviously a lot of <laughs> metadata, a lot of in-sourcing. So uh, all sources that were used to construct the ontology are also codified within the ontology itself, um, meaning that you can really drill down and see where things came from or look for extra sources if you're more interested in a specific term or specific concept. Um, and then we used a number of computational and um, personal um, uh, accountabilities to showcase like, oh, this is efficient for things like natural language processing of electronic health record notes, but it's also important and readable for individuals who are looking uh, online who don't have any computational experience, which I will say was a hard bridge to gap. Um, we used a four-step process that was outlined in uh, a, paper, a paper called, um, and I'll have to move, uh, methodologies, tools, and languages for building ontologies, where is the meeting point? Uh, and I will say, if you don't really know what an ontology is, um, it's a linked data vocabulary, but turned up to 11, um, where you're trying to formalize as many structures as possible, reuse identifiers, uh, emphasize data integrity and data standards. Uh, and oftentimes that can be at odds with readability. Uh, I think you'll find a lot of ontologies are constructed purely for uh, computers to look at, which I think is kind of not great. Uh, I think you should try to straddle the between each side, but um, there are different ways to do that. And so we went with this process, which involves uh, identifying particular seed terms, searching those seed terms within given databases, and then using frequency analysis to discover new seed terms to then research the database until we don't get any new uh, C terms, essentially. Now, this is a really intensive process and going to take a very long time, depending on the subject area. Um, so I would tell you, unless you have three or four years to dedicate to this, <laughs> uh, it might not be a good idea, depending on your use case. In terms of exploring, uh, this kind of involved basically how do we discover additional relevant databases? What if our preconceived notions of which databases were good were bad? And so this typically involved looking through all of the sources for every single article we would find, determine if they were present in other databases, and then add those databases in as well. Um, we also wanted to use things like typical Google search. Uh, and yes, we even used Bing search just to make sure <laughs> we weren't biasing ourselves with our results. Um, and then after that, we do the most difficult part, in my opinion, and this is the part I uh, dislike the most. We, we really wanted to make sure that there were strict is a superclass subclass, subclass relationships. Uh, and so that means if something is put into a, uh, or made a subclass of something else, that it is a something of that. So a transgender person is a person, for instance, which can be kind of, uh, it can throw some people off, I think, who are used to more uh, Wikipedia style categories or uh, LCSH style categories, wherein sometimes everything that's related is thrown as like a subclass. Um, but we did add things like related terms, derived terms, and other relationships to kind of make up for that. 
it was a very difficult process. This took the longest, I will say. And then finally, we moved on to abstraction. And this is also kind of a difficult point. Um, there are about 150 different things you could do here. Uh, looking at dialect information, geographical locale, are we including um, biased sources uh, in a new direction? Should we include more sources? How should we encode those sources? So for instance, all web related sources we archived in the internet archive to make sure that there were permalinks available. Um, and a number of other issues with source availability were uh, potential issues. And so we might say, oh, this source is great, but there are four copies available of it worldwide. <laughs> Like, let's pick another source, for instance, to make sure that this is something that people can actually drill down to in real life and not have to wait on a, a waiting list for months to read. Um, we chose Protege, which is developed at Stanford University as our building mechanism. Um, we natively coded in RDF XML, um, but exported to a bunch of different formats, including JSON uh, and Manhattan formats, if you're more in the ontology school thing. Uh, this helped us a lot because the Protege uh, software is free, open source, uh, supports w, uh, W3C standards, um, and it has so many, it, like an outrageous number of plugins, although some may not work for the most recent version. And so we had two basic releases. Um, the first release we improved on a lot by adding stricter mapping relationships. We made sure that all classes had definitions. Um, we included, oh, now we wanted to make sure that we wanted to meet people where they were at. And so this included computationally. So if somebody else was using a particular ontology, like the medical subject headings or the homosaurus or the human phenotype ontology or something of that sort that we mapped to all of those. Um, so for instance, if you were doing all of your coding using Wikidata and you wanted to move over to GSSO or you had GSSO and you wanted to move to Wikidata, we would facilitate those mappings where they exist. And so for most of the ontologies, um, we had a massive increase in the number of mappings from version one to version two. Wikidata and Wikipedia are not shown here, but there were, uh, they easily doubled the number uh, up to about 28,000. <laughs> um, so it was definitely in our minds to make sure interoperability was utilized. And so we went with a structure of don't reinvent the wheel. If somebody else did it well, like the chemical, uh, the chemical ontology for biological uh, in entities, Kibi, is the best chemistry ontology out there, right? And so if they're telling us we're classifying different forms of estradiol that are used for gender affirming hormone therapy in a particular way, I'm not gonna tell the chemists <laughs> that their chemistry is wrong. I'm going to incorporate those URIs um, so they're more usable uh, and they can link to chemical databases, for instance. And so with that, um, I think I still have enough time, hopefully. Um, I can show at least a couple things. Um, so the way the GSSO website is set up, you can go there simply by typing in gsso.info. I will say, if you are trying this, we are an academic health center where this is located, so we don't have a really robust system uh, and so there will be downtime. If there is downtime, feel free to email me. Um, but essentially you can choose things like a random entry here and it will load in this way, telling you all the ancestors and descendants of that thing, and as well as linking to other systems. Um, we also support a number of, and I graph this for posterity's sake. So let's say you have an LCSH identifier and you wanna map it. Um, you can do this by going in the URI directly and typing in anything else and it will redirect you here. Uh, and this should work with most systems. So like if you took a Homosaurus URI and we're working on integrating version three, it should also redirect here. You can also do this from the search function and it will redirect you as well. Um, we also do some text detection. So using natural language processing in Python in the background um, to load different terms that might be associated with particular text. I would be careful with this. It probably at this point will only support maybe two or three pages. I wouldn't go beyond that or your load times might get insane, but all the code is open source on the uh, GitHub. So if you are looking to do language tagging yourself, um, you can look at the GitHub here at um, superreactor slash GSSO. Um, and 
contact me if you have any problems. We also list all of the various publications. Uh, and if you're trying to do stuff from BioPortal, which is done by the National Center for Biomedical Ontologies, um, you can do things using some of the guides here. Um, we are also at identifiers.org, and I'm working on uh, integrating a backwards compatibility through um, Wikidata, making sure that we map to Wikidata, but we want to make sure Wikidata maps to us as well, um, in case that is an issue. We're a member of the Oboe Foundry. We recently got approved for MARC schema, so we are integrated in all of these places. Um, and we've been working on a number of different projects. Uh, if you're looking at just seeing how long the list is, um, it's a pretty long list of a number of different terms. Um, and as the single programmer here, um, it's often difficult for me to do all of this. So if people have suggestions, I've got a backlog of about 2,500 terms, but uh, I prioritize whenever people email me with different ones that they would like. Uh, and I prioritize mappings to other uh, systems as they exist to meet halfway. Um, we've also done a couple smaller projects. So for instance, I wrote a paper on a transgender bibliography from 1790 to 1999, wherein we did auto mapping um, to a number of different uh, periodicals. And so we display here are the GSSO terms next to the provided mesh terms. So you can see that we were able to tag about triple the number of terms, uh, which is typically helpful in terms of figuring out, hey, what is this actually about? Um, we're also working on projects with the GLBT Museum and Archives and the AIDS History Project uh, in a similar fashion, working on semi-automated tagging. So the way that it would work is essentially they uh, download our system, we auto tag everything we think is in the document, they review those, maybe go over the full document if they think some of the tagging is bad, which does happen occasionally, uh, and they let us know. So this is what it looks like in Protege itself. And if anybody needs links or anything, please let me know. Um, we use two levels of hierarchy here. Um, this is mostly to keep things kind of in line. Uh, if you're an archivist or librarian, I know typically plurals are utilized. We use alternate name for plurals and label, which is the RDFS class for um, the singulars. And this has to do with its use in educational and training programs, which is sometimes different um, just for readability purposes. Um, we are working on some redos. Um, so for instance, we currently have the, the largest um, uh, list of different related uh, Native American First Nations terminologies. We try our best to include as many references as we can, and as well as like translations in a native script if they exist, uh, which is not always the case. Uh, we've also been working on building out a number of um, terms in, uh, in Hindi and Urdu, um, which has different effects because a lot of the publications are uh, in native language are not by people of these categories. And so they're reflecting can sometimes be a little bit difficult, but we try to include a uh, native script if it's a uh, word or concept that isn't actually like really potentially possible to talk about very well in English um, with sources as well. Uh, and sources are referenced as individuals here with links uh, that should be persistent to wherever they exist. And at that point, that is uh, about it, I think. <laughs> so thank you all so much. Uh, and I think I can pass it on to the next speaker. That's amazing. I just had this word in my mouth, but I'm so impressed. So <laughs> Claire, that was your, your PhD thesis. That, that's mm -hmm. the, that work you did all by yourself? Yes. Wow. <laughs> Crazy. I mean, I was I was locked inside for a while, so I didn't have much to do. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, well, that um, uh, that makes me think of earlier this week we had a metadata presentation that was called uh, "Metadata Can Kill," and another one that uh, I, I joke about that metadata can save your lives. <laughs> but I think you have another case where metadata can be a metadata and the content of the, the, the metadata terms can be another situation of life or death. 
<laughs> if, uh, um, and I, I don't think I'm exaggerating here. In the healthcare, it's so important that uh, if uh, both parties don't have the, the right vocabulary, the pre precise vocabulary to establish a diagnostic, it can lead to, uh, uh, to um, bad consequences. Or <laughs> so, yeah. wow, uh, that's, um, yeah, I think I'll add that to my list of uh, <laughs> that attack and kill or save. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I will mention um, as well, there was a lot of debate. The version one, we tried to make an, interna an international edition. Uh, ultimately, what we ended up finding out was that conceptualizations in other languages were very different. And so the hierarchies that we were constructing just weren't accurate. And we didn't want to be like, oh, this is an English ontology. And then we include some other stuff, um, but we basically ignore it. Uh, and so there have been some efforts. I've had a couple colleagues from France and uh, Portugal specifically reach out to me about doing French and Portuguese versions. Uh, it is open source and licensed. So I do encourage people who want to do development in other languages to do their own version that maps. Um, but I don't wanna necessarily promote further medical colonialism and be like, I'm the American who's telling you how to do it. I, I think that's oftentimes unhelpful and contradictory, um, but that's my opinion. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, if anybody has interest in uh, multilingual components, um, feel free to reach out. I can send you all the information you need to get started on that and provide any help if you need. Fantastic. Thank you again, Claire. Thank you. It's now time to welcome our next two speakers, Rachel Clark and Sayard Schoonmaker. Rachel and Sayard, you have the control of the screen. Can everyone see our slides? Yes. Excellent. Thanks so much. And thank you all for coming to this panel today. Uh, I'm Rachel Ivy Clark. I'm joined today by my uh, colleague, Sayard Schoonmaker. We're going to oh. talk. Oh, so go ahead, say hi. I can't see I you because I'm sharing my screen. <laughs> yes, hi. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about a design-based research project that we did called the Critical Catalog, where we attempt to use a design prototype to address problematic metadata. So I'm actually going to push back a little bit on something that Amber Billy said earlier about asking why do we record gender. And um, Sarah and I are both uh, American. We're, we met at an American university and in the context of American librarianship. And organizations like the American Library Association explicitly call out diversity as a core value of the field. Um, it's also a priority for many other institutions and organizations, both within the US and I'm sure around the world. And ALA specifically calls for libraries and librarians to provide access to resources both by diverse populations, and that includes uh, diverse representations of gender, sexuality, sexual identity, but certainly not limited to that, by those populations and for those populations. And ALA also calls for the promotion of those diverse reading materials and other library resources. And increasingly, people do want to find resources, for instance, by women or about women or by LGBTQ authors, things like that. And librarians want ways to not only find these resources to help their patrons, but also be able to include them in their collections and to audit their collections to see where there might be gaps or missing items or underrepresentation. Uh, so we uh, wanted to ask how can libraries provide access to or much less promote these resources if they're not identifiable as diverse in some way? Uh, so where, where we began, um, our first step was uh, toward exploring more systematic access to diverse library materials. Um, and to do so, we wanted to understand what metadata is necessary and able to, um, to enable access points for such materials. Uh, so we conducted a field scan of contemporary metadata schemas to determine what, uh, if any, metadata exists to represent diverse library materials and what metadata elements and values are necessary, uh, but perhaps not currently present. Uh, we chose uh, schemas that intentionally aim to describe diverse materials, both inside and outside of libraries, uh, and for wider comparison, 
uh, several standard library schemas and general schemas intended for broad use and application. Uh, so what resulted uh, from, from this field scan was a set of uh, semantic crosswalks that identified elements of access points in schemas that had the potential to express diversity. Um, so what you're seeing on the slide is uh, a crosswalk uh, specific to uh, elements describing the identities or demographics of creators. Um, and it, it, as the, the panel's focus, um, I'm sharing a little bit uh, around the findings related to gender. Um, so specifically in the um, creator elements, there were uh, seven of the 13 schemas we looked at included some element that um, had the potential to express gender uh, and sexuality. Uh, and uh, furthermore, the, in, in the resource elements, there were far fewer access points in, in regards to gender. Um, and then we found overall um, uh, in, in elements that were predominant across both creator and resource uh, descriptive elements, uh, which we deemed a basket element. Um, and this is a repeatable element often describing a resource's subjects or contents uh, that groups many identity specific values together. Uh, so named for grouping these disparate uh, descriptors together in one metaphorical basket. Um, so whereas there are specific points of access, we also had to pay attention to these um, elements that could collect a variety of, of different information that could potentially express diversity. Uh, so despite the prevalence of uh, elements to express gender and creator metadata, we found issue with uh, that access point as well as other access points. Um, we found a binary treatment of identity or identity is fixed or immutable. Um, an example we used, uh, we looked at uh, Goodreads as uh, you know, a, a popular um, schema outside of the library world. Uh, and uh, in Goodreads, these uh, two gender elements formatted as questions and books details. So a question that says, do you think there is a strong female character in this book? And do you think there's a strong male character in this book? And the option is a toggle of yes or no with those two, the only those two options. Um, we also found that, uh, that elements expressing gender and other uh, the demographic details are not traditionally used in libraries as a point of access, uh, but often used as uh, disambiguation in authority records. Um, and furthermore, the information related to gender um, is unstandardized or may appear in various el elements and fields, uh, which uh, presents uh, issues in findability and, and expression. And of course, there are the problems of descriptive metadata, uh, the, um, that these values or labels can be pejorative. Um, and there's a, there's a risk of pigeonholing or stereotyping both resources and creators. Um, and of course, who has the um, authority uh, to label uh, someone's gender or sexuality? Um, and the, there runs a pot potential risk of outing a creator. Uh, so our original intention, we really did this field scan with the intent of using these findings to design a new library catalog interface that would use these identity-based access points to offer access to resources, like being able to retrieve all the books uh, in a collection by from like lesbian authors, for example. But given all of the issues that we found with these existing access points, we were really hesitant to draw on these existing systems and methods, because especially we didn't want to perpetuate the harms that we saw in, in situations that they could cause. So you really want to think in a new way from a new perspective. So we drew on a specific form of design called critical design. Uh, you know, it aims to be provocative it aims to create tools that intentionally provoke people to think in new ways. It's a specific form of activist research to get people to shift their perspective. 
So while the traditional objectives of cataloging, right, we think about they help people find materials, identify materials, select materials, and obtain materials, right, put forth by IFLA, and, and many of our models are built on this idea. We actually sort of rejected that, and we drew on a provocative alternative objective uh, of library cataloging, that of the idea of expression. There's a well-established body of research showing that every information system, library catalogs included, expresses a particular perspective or a point of view, whether it expresses it intentionally or not. So drawing on this perspective, um, we also said, let's look at this idea of white normativity, uh, this idea that frames sort of the, the white male category as the neutral or standard, the default category of human beings. And so based on that, we decided that instead of sort of labeling the diverse resources, we wanted to create a catalog that tried to what we call flip the script through the idea of labeling the traditional norm, in this case, cisgender, white, able-bodied, sort of canonical male authors. And the motivation behind this was uh, serving multiple purposes. First, the idea of preventing those harmful labels being applied to traditionally minoritized populations that have already suffered years of labeling harm. We also thought that this approach had the potential to surface a lot of power implications and imbalances by explicitly labeling the characteristics that are traditionally unlabeled because they're assumed to be the default. And this could help us uh, destabilize that sort of patriarchal norm. And finally, we really want to provide a, some kind of functional and logistical mechanism to actually make this happen, but also um, try to make it happen in a more intersectional way. So I'm now going to let Sayer tell you how we actually did this. Okay, thanks. Uh, so to build the critical catalog, we started with uh, an open source ILS Koha. Uh, so this is a, a screenshot of the interface. Uh, it was important for us to work within a pre-existing system um, because Koha is used by nearly 5,000 libraries worldwide and, worldwide and building our design artifact from within the software offered very similar, oh, I can't say that word today. It offered a, a, <laughs> a more familiar experience for a potential users experience. Uh, and furthermore, working within the constraint of Koha uh, allowed us to see throughout the design process, the rhetorical arguments and points of view and biases expressed uh, by this knowledge organization system. Uh, so the first thing we did was populated Koha with bibliographic records from Library of Congress, uh, which also allowed us to analyze the legacy of bibliographic data. Uh, and we selected two use cases, one reflecting science fiction reading materials and an, another reflecting uh, biographical nonfiction resources. Uh, and then from there, we started to change metadata and system settings to find a path to our goal of returning diverse resources to the top of any search list. Um, so in short, we were using metadata and system settings as our design materials. Uh, so we ran into a lot of problems. <laughs> uh, so everything, um, everything we tried revealed some challenge or shortcoming in the system. Uh, one of them, some mark fields are not currently indexed in ILSs. Uh, we were looking at uh, the 386 and 385 field from uh, the um, Library of Congress creator contributor characteristics and audience characteristics. Um, established in 2013, but they're not currently indexed uh, by Koha. So that presented a challenge. Uh, furthermore, we, start, we started by trying uh, to search by exclusion, asking the system not to return everything, uh, to return everything besides what we deemed in the, the records we deemed in the white male canon. But that still required for us to label um, all, ev all the other resources. Um, and in all, all the things that we tried, <laughs> uh, the relevancy, the relevance, our algorithm always returned results uh, from records that we had placed in the white male canon. 
So after many design trials, uh, we began to look at pre-existing sorting fields in Koha. Um, so what we decided was to work with the publication date because you could sort uh, results by uh, newest to oldest. Uh, so we found that if we uh, change the public publication date of all the resources we deemed as part of the White Mail Canon uh, to uh, a, a date in the past, and then change the default setting to sort search results by publication date from newest to oldest, uh, we could get all the resources uh, to appear at the top of the search list, everything outside of the White Mail Canon. Uh, and to, so as you can see in this slide, the, the publication date remains uh, correct to this record. Can you go to the, yeah, thanks. Uh, so what we did in, is we looked to the fixed fields uh, and to record a publication date uh, or to change a publication date so that from a user end, uh, perspective, the publication date remained the same, but from the back end, uh, we changed it. So this brought up a lot of conversation and questions. So changing the date in the fixed field, uh, we, in a kind of tricky way, we didn't necessarily mislabel the resource, but rather manipulated the indexing software by way of metadata. So um, we found that in a sense, we found a loophole in the design process. And so you can see from this screenshot that the fixed uh, field, o, the 008 fixed field has been year, uh, changed to the year 1619 and building from Feinberg's positive systems expressing rhetorical arguments and Seaver's refusal to distinguish cultural details from technical details, uh, we decided to record 1619 as the publication year in the fixed field for all of the resources in the white male canon. Uh, our use of 1619 stems from the New York Times 1619 project uh, led by staff writer Hannah Nicole Jones, uh, so named because 1619 marks the, the year of the first slave ship to land in the British colony of pre present day Virginia. So remember that the aim of critical design is provocation rather than any sort of commercial marketable product. The prototype that we built was never intended for widespread applications, but we still think it really offers both practical and intellectual implications. For instance, one of the biggest things we found is it makes a really powerful and explicit demonstration of just how expressive library catalogs are making their positionality much more visible. And ideally, we hope more intentional that people will stop and think about what is embedded in these systems and what these systems are communicating, whether they intend to or not, and going forward, being more thoughtful and more intentional about the metadata that they put into these systems. One of the most significant findings is one of the things Sayard really talked about is this stark disconnect between cataloging metadata that library catalogers create and the systems through which users interact with that metadata. And what we really found is no matter how much metadata you add, no matter the quality of that metadata, if the system doesn't use it to sort, to retrieve, to index, that metadata is useless. And that also leads us to questions about who has the power to control these systems and their affordances. We purposefully chose Koha because it was open source and could be modifiable, but your average library cataloger probably doesn't have the knowledge, the training, or the skill to perform that kind of in-depth uh, work on the piece of software. So even though this catalog is not an implementable solution, the prototype provokes discussions and opens a lot of structural space for new questions and possibilities. Things like redesigning systems and their underlying models to draw on self-identification and self-description. Things like folksonomies, Wikidata, right, the homosaurus, things that we've heard about today and lots of other approaches that really reflect this idea that communities get to describe themselves. We're hoping that this can open more space for that. We hope that this helps people rethink what the objectives of cataloging really are. 
are they really about finding and retrieving resources or are there other objectives that we should be thinking about in terms of promotion and advocacy as well as expression? Um, how can we use these tools as activist tools? We wanna think about revisiting and revising sort of traditional and taken for granted principles of metadata and classification. One of the ones that, that comes to my mind is this idea of metadata is supposed to be based on permanent uh, descriptions, the canon of permanence, say from Ranganathan, and things like, you know, as we've seen, gender and sexual identity are not fluid or static. And so we're trying basically to put a square peg in a round hole by even recording this in the first place under the models of metadata that, that we've developed. And ultimately, sort of redefining this notion of diversity and what quote unquote diverse materials actually means to move beyond simple identity characteristics, right? This book is by a woman, this book is about LGBT topics to more, uh, again, activist um, definitions such as the one put forth by um, Emil Lawrence from Rutgers that diverse books are those that we need to surface and promote because they're um, underrepresented in society so that we can move beyond description to more action and activism. So thank you very much for listening to our talk. Thank you, Sayard, for joining me today. And we look forward to your questions during the question and answer session. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you very much, uh, Sayard. I believe that these two are too humble to, uh, to mention that this research was the object of an article which won the Outstanding Publication Award in 2020. Uh, so last year, uh, it's an award uh, presented by the Association of Library Collections and Technical Services, ALCTS. And uh, yes, you could brag about it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we, we, we just had a presentation of an award-winning article. That's, a, that's an award-winning uh, research to start with, right? Yes, <laughs> you fully deserve that. <laughs> yes, and we did. Um, Marie Claude, I think the slides will be shared later. Yes. Yes. On the website, we did uh, put a resources list at the end of the slides uh, with some of the things we referenced and also a citation for that paper for anyone who wants to maybe take a look at it. Oh, that's uh, that's perfect. Yes, if you want to know right now, uh, the original article is in the Journal of Documentation, Volume 76, Issue 1, right? Um, okay, good. Yeah, it's, you can find it, the title, Metadata for Diversity. Super. Thank you very much to you both again. And now it's time to welcome our last speaker, John Samuel. John, it's finally your turn. Thank you very much. <laughs> Can I, okay, I share my screen. Can you sh uh, see my screen? Is it fine? Almost, yes. Thank you, okay. Hi everybody. Uh, thank you DCMI, especially Nishad and Mary Claude for inviting me to this panel, Metadata and Gen Gender Diversity. For this panel, I'll be talking about modeling and documenting cure voices and topics on Wikidata. I'm John Samuel, Associate Professor, or officially Ansonia Scherscher at CP Lyon. And today's talk is based on my personal experience as a Wikidata contributor and my research and teaching experience on semantic web and data science. A quick outline on what I will be presenting today. <clears throat> a brief intro introduction on Wikidata LGBT plus group a very quick introduction on Wikidata and a detailed presentation on how the community is modeling cure voices and topics. Finally, I will conclude and present the future course of actions. First of all, uh, Wikidata LGBT plus project. It is one of the many active Wiki projects on Wikidata with the goal of improving the coverage of LGBT plus topics on Wikidata. This group consists of the both the LGBT community members and allies. That brings me to the next topic. What is Wikidata? Wikidata started in the year 2012 and is a closest project of Wikipedia. 
And what makes it so special? It is free and open like Wikipedia, but it's also linked, structured, collaborative, and multilingual knowledge base, which makes it an important site towards building an inclusive and a multilingual web. Considering its structured nature, it's easy to analyze and understand what's missing and what can be improved. Wikidata has also brought a big shift, the shift from multiple subdomain multilingual Wikipedia sites to a single domain multilingual websites, that is www.wikidata.org. So let's start with the first topic, LGBT, which is also called as an item on Wikidata. So as you can see on this figure, the item has an identifier Q17884, and it's referred to using this number. This is to ensure the machine readability. But for human readability, we have labels, we have descriptions, and we have aliases in the supported languages. I would like to highlight the role of aliases on this, on this slide. So as you can see on the right-hand side, you have got something called also known as where you could see um, many ways by which we have said LGBTs. As you can see, as Marie Claude presented this topic uh, of gender diversity, we had clearly seen the very, the different terms that is being used by the community. So you have GLBT, LGBT, IQ, LGBT, IQ2, S, et cetera. So these have, have been documented on the right-hand side as a part of also known as. So the advantage is if you want to search the to any of these topics with any of these terms, you could easily find, find them on Wikidata. And for my next slide, <clears throat> I will show you the same identifier, the same page, I'm on the same page. Uh, I have la labels in different languages, multilingual labels in French, Irish, Scottish Gaelic, uh, Galicians. I've just highlighted a couple of them, but there are many other languages, almost 300, 300 of them. Okay, let's now talk about this, the goal of this, uh, uh, this panel, uh, sexual and gender diversity. So for this, I would like to show, highlight the case of uh, Sam Smith. Uh, and if you go on their profile, what in back in 2019, Sam Smith announced that they are non-binary. So the contributors doc documented their gender in the following way. First and foremost, they use the property P21, sex or gender. I would not like to enter uh, why we call it sex or gender because we are trying, the community is trying to have a new property which is being put on uh, vote. Uh, but it has not been created separation of sex or gender. But at, for the time being, let's as, uh, consider that we have on, got only one property, sex or gender, P21, for documenting the gender. As you can see, we the community members have documented their uh, identity and they have added qualifiers saying the announcement date was on 16th March uh, 2019. But it's also important to note that there are references. And in this case, there are three references, including two news articles. The so next example is of Elliot Page. Uh, and when he declared their pronoun, uh, his pronouns as his, uh, the community members decided to document it. And you could see that we documented this case in, on Oct uh, 1st December, 2020, when he declared this uh, on their Instagram, uh, on his Instagram page saying, hi friends, I want to share with you that I'm trans. My pronouns are he and they, uh, and my name is Elliot. And as you can also see in this, on this slide, we have got two values for the personal pronouns. Uh, note again, the, uh, the presence of references, which are very important in the case of uh, 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 gender and sexual diverse, uh, uh, gender and sexual, uh, uh, inform, um, orientation information. Once again, I come back to the example of Sam Smith, who declared that their pronouns are they and them in September 2019. This has been documented and you could see there are three references which are being used here to, uh, uh, to let the users verify this claim. This brings me to the next topic of analysis. As I said, Wikidata is a multilingual knowledge base and I want to see the use of personal pronouns in different languages. That is the use of P6993, uh, which, which we have already seen. Uh, as you can see, the, the use of personal pronouns is very common in English language, but that does not mean that the other languages do not support non-binary pronouns. 
one may feel to ask how other languages support non-binary persons. Please check this URL for a detailed analysis on uh, the labels, sorry, the, the personal pronouns that are available in the other languages. Finally, I would also like to see who, what are the contributors documenting? Uh, so I would like to see what, who is using they, what, what are their professions? So um, the, what we have found is that this by this analysis that writers, actors, singers, television actors quite usually share their personal pronouns like they in this case, and the other professions are not well documented. So one may ask uh, why there are less professions, uh, why we do not have information from other professions. Uh, so it's not because that, uh, uh, it's uh, that we do not have any information. It's because sometimes this information do not come up on the social media and we do not, and the contributors have no way to document them on Wikidata. So another important topic is the uh, aspect of sexual orientation that we, doc, uh, for that we use the property number P91. It is important to, it is important to know that Wikidata is not a place for outing persons against their will. So, uh, so pre-91 is a, a special property uh, where we have, where we keep periodically check whether there are references. So in this case, you see uh, Sam Smith had uh, announced their homosexuality and we have got a reference and we have got uh, details of the references and the date when this date, uh, a news article was retrieved from the website. In this case, uh, eoonline.com. Now that we have seen how to document the cure voices on Wikidata and improve the visibility of cure people, the next topic is how can I document LGBT related uh, plus related topics? And I start with the fun filled and colorful pride parades. Uh, the Wiki, on Wikidata, a lot of pride parades can be uh, seen from across the world and you can use the identifier Q51404 to find the nearest and the most recent pride in your city or town. Uh, Stonewall is a well-known organization uh, uh, to the LGBT community, but this is, uh, uh, this is in UK, but such organizations do exist in many other countries, and in some cases, every major town of your country. You can do document some, uh, the, some missing organizations in your town or city by creating a new Wikidata item and linking it to the Wikidata item Q6458277 using the property P31 or instance of. And what about music? Uh, yes, on Wikidata is also possible to document the chorus, especially the LGBT plus chorus, the LGBT chorus with the identifier Q1820625. Next, we have got the uh, film festivals uh, uh, on LGBT related themes. You can find them using the identifier Q6201825. Then we have got the LGBT community centers and LGBT IQA plus bookshop. Sadly, I would like to say that uh, pandemic has affected many libraries and bookshops across the world and then some have been forced to shut their doors because of the financial reasons. Yet the role played by these libraries and community centers cannot be forgotten. And if you are aware of any such library, please document them on Wikidata for future generations. And also what about uh, the LGBT related themes? If you know of some films with LGBT related uh, topics or characters, you can make use of the property P106, which is Jenner and link it to the identifier Q20448. So now people may ask, is, are things really improving for the LGBT community? Or do we have enough literature? So, let I, uh, so I, in this case, I wanted to sh uh, check an analysis. So I checked all the books that have been marked by the community members as LGBT uh, literature. And we could see that there has been an improvement in the literature. We see many uh, books have been uh, published from the year 2000 and this number is quite, uh, is increasing. Uh, but what are these languages? Are these books available in other languages? Or are they just focused on English? So these are the questions that we may 
like to analyze and we may also like to understand in order to improve this uh, uh, the visibility of the LGBT community in across across the world. And for that, uh, I need to highlight that the LGBT archives and magazines play an important role. I've highlighted a couple of them on this particular slide. Now, finally, I would like to conclude this topic saying that there are various ways, there are various topics that we have seen. And as we are learning about human sexuality, people have trying to create, uh, people are trying to find pride in their communities. And the rainbow and the pride flags have played an important role. And on this slide, I'm showing a couple of pride flags which have been documented. If you see close carefully, there is also the Wikidata identifier with which you can find the associated Wikidata item and the associated Wikipedia entry for the different communities. And then comes the LGBT awareness days. You have got different awareness days in different uh, countries. You also have got the day for the International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia and Biphobia on May 17, uh, National Coming Out Day in UK and US. You have got the LGBT history months in US and UK. Uh, and in fact, in, also in Canada as well. Um, and uh, they play an important role for the visibility of this community. What I would like to say that these things are added on Wikidata. These things have, if you want to search more information, if, our, uh, if, if you want to know how things are happening in different countries, Wikidata can be used, can be easily used to analyze such information. Uh, so it's not just limited to that. Limit, Wikidata also lets you document uh, LGBT plus rights in different countries of the world. It's a bit more complicated. If you see uh, the way that these things have been documented on Wikipedia, this is very, very interesting. So you have, you can read about the progress of LGBT rights across different countries on the topic of decriminalization of homosexuality, civil, civil union rights, same-sex marriage, gender identity laws, non-discrimination uh, non laws. And there have been some attempts to document them on Wikidata, but they are not as, uh, it's not that as clear because of the structure nature, nature of Wikidata. It's a bit complicated and the community is still working on improving and documenting these type of aspects on Wikidata. Uh, finally, I wish to conclude uh, with all these images that we have seen with, before going to some tables uh, that it's also important that if you know some uh, uh, LGBT rights activities, activists in your area or in your uh, locality, in your city, please use Q1950921 and link it with the occupation uh, field and it will help us to find the contributions made by these activists across the world. And, and, and also, uh, it could be a motivating for, uh, uh, factor for many people in other in places of difficulty. So I would like to end with some okay uh, enough with those images. Some uh, some interesting aspects. Some something about modeling. I would like to share a couple of slides uh, uh, sharing some key aspects about sex or gender since we are in the DCMI uh, meeting. Uh, so, for example, first slide where I'm seeing is uh, is talking about P21, uh, and we have got a, a specific uh, field, an item called Q48264, the sex, where we are documented the different possibilities to document the sex of sex or gender of a person. So here I'm highlighting uh, just a couple of them, intersex person, non-binary, female, male, two-spirit, etc. So if you want to know, if you are looking for books written by non-binary people, you can use these identifiers to find those books. Or if you want to filter with the help of, uh, with the help of country, you could also do them on Wikidata. Please check this complete list on the bottom of the, uh, the slide uh, for the complete list of genders. Finally, about uh, sexual orientation. Uh, sexual orientation uh, is also uh, being documented by the property P91 or linked with the item Q17888. So you have got asexuality, bisexuality, heterosexuality, homosexuality, pansexuality. Once again, this is not an exhaustive list and you could check uh, the community curated list uh, on, on, the, on the link given below. 
finally, it was great to hear a lot from Homo Soros uh, uh, database and GSSO identifier. It was very good to see that uh, that they, there have been so many interesting terms that have been collected by the Homo Soros community and the GSSO uh, uh, community. And Wikidata is not uh, separated. We are trying to link it with different external databases. And I'm hi highlighting some of the databases here. And there was a, and I think somebody, uh, I think Claire talked about it, that there are like almost 20, 14,000 items that have been linked to Wikidata, but inversely, there are only 80. It's just to, I want to just say that this is a new field. It's P9827. It's a very new uh, external identifier. I hope we will be able to connect to more terms on Homo Soros and GSSO in, in the future. And it will be very, very helpful for both the community for GSSO and for the Wikidata contributors. A uh, couple, or, couple of slides, I talked about pride flag. And if you want to document a pride flag, I'm just highlighting a couple of fields, important fields. You could say that it's an instance of the pride flag. You could say the year that this has been created, uh, the colors, the various colors that are present. Then for that, you need to give an identifier for the colors. And you could say the person or the organizer organization behind this uh, uh, behind this particular flag. Similarly, for the activist, I gave a simple example uh, and uh, I gave an image uh, previously. Here I'm talking about uh, how to document it. So you could say uh, uh, the person, it's a person, it's a human and their occupation is act rights activist, their family name, their given name, but and and it, if and and finally the sex or gender, sexual orientation, and personal pronoun. And for that, I would like to say, like what Amber said, we do not want to add just by ourselves. We need that the persons say themselves what is their sex or gender, what is their sexual orientation, what is their personal pronoun. Nothing should be documented against their will. This is very important. In, in uh, for the Wikidata co contributors. So lastly, I would like to <laughs> conclude my, uh, my talk. Uh, uh, sorry, I would, uh, I, a big thanks to uh, the community members who have been doing this uh, for years, but there is still a lot, thing, lot of things to be improved. You can find a gap between the uh, global South and the global North, you could uh, see uh, a difference of uh, information from these two uh, these two areas. Uh, of course, we are we organize uh, editathons in different places to improve the LGBT uh, history on Wikidata. Uh, we also have awareness months. We have create uh, show social media tags like ha hashtag LGBT History Month, which play an important role for the documentation. Then we have uh, some concerns related to notability. What is notable? Because we cannot just add something without references. Uh, so what is a notable media in a, in a country? What is a not notable media in a city? We do not know. And sometimes it's very difficult to know, uh, document this information. Uh, this, doc this data is always incomplete. You could not have all the information. You cannot document everything. Uh, we are still learning, as we have already heard from Claire, Amber, and Rachel, and Sevad, uh, that this is this is ongoing. We are still learning. We are still learning about human sexuality. We are still learning about gender, and we are still learning about people, forgotten people in the history of uh, uh, of the world. Like how many people have been forgotten? They were just ignored by their community the, at that time. And, and this is the moment that we are in, the, in this part. I think in this century, we are lucky enough to find uh, people who are researching, who are trying to find those people and bring them to the uh, external world. And of course, the external identifiers play an important role. Finally, I would like to finish that data quality is a very important thing and references play an important role. I also want to talk about one work that is being done by the Dublin Core uh, community, that is a, a DCTAP, which is which will help people to easily, uh, any contributor to write information in a very simpler manner, 
And this could be linked with the entity schemas present on Wikidata, which could help people to document more and more information on the on the com on Wikidata. And I think it, it will be very interesting in the upcoming years. And of course, I would like to once again highlight, if you know about any external databases which could help us to document things, please use them. Finally, this check these three links. The first one is for the Wikidata community and the last two for Wikipedia and Wikimedia projects in general. Thank you very much once again for giving me this opportunity to share with you what the community has been doing on uh, Wikidata. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Um, I think Wikidata is to be commended for, for this uh, project, uh, Wikidata LGBT, uh, because of its, uh, as the a multilingual knowledge base that is behind uh, Wikidata projects such as Wikipedia, uh, that's such high visibility that it brings to uh, to the community and the, and the, the, the awareness and the issues and, and so on. So that's, uh, that's work that uh, makes me optimistic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank so you. it's now your turn, dear participant, to continue the conversation with our speakers. So we'll start the question and answer period. I remind you to use the, the Zoom chat function to send your questions to all participants and I will read them for you. So I'll check right away if we have uh, questions. Thanks for the shout out, DTC. <laughs> okay, there are comments so far. Um, well, I have a question to start while uh, participants type in their, uh, their questions. In your respective projects uh, that you just presented, what has been the haha moment? The moment that you said that, yes, someone something, yes, this is going to work, yes, that's going to, to meet my objectives. And uh, so, or what, what, what was the key, the key moment, the key uh, uh, turning point? If there's any. I guess I'll, I'll start and, Sayard, um, I think Sayard talked about it a little bit in our presentation, so please chime in. But for us, right, we really had that struggle with system functionality and, and how do we how do we basically shoehorn this system that we have little to no control over, despite claims that it should offer a lot of control, you know, being open source and, and things like that. How, how do we how do we make it do what we want to do? And we we tried, you know, this is a very short presentation in some of the papers, you can read more about all of the myriad things we tried before we hit upon, let's trick the system with this publication date thing. Um, and, and I think when we found that, Sarah, maybe you can chime in, like we, we kind of were like, yay, but then also we were kind of like, is oh. this cool? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, is this ethical? We had a lot of conversations about that ethics of it um so while it was i think an aha moment it was also a it, it was a ooh ooh <laughs> moment maybe yeah i think especially i met rachel while i was pursuing an mls at, at syracuse and so i many of the things i was learning were um you know the f foundations and practices of of librarianship and um uh, yeah, how to organize information. And so then the idea of like, oh, a fixed field. <laughs> Can we do this? Can we just ch change things? And but then once we once we started to do it, it was it was really exciting because uh, it it made and that's when we br uh, brought in the um, Lewis Hyde's um, research on tricksterism that if we were thinking if this was right or wrong or good or bad and then started to take an approach of well we're we're trying to transgress a boundary to um reveal underlying sets of assumptions of of how how all of this information is expressed um so it was yeah it felt very exciting and a, a little scary in a fun way Um, I would say in my work, 
one of the most difficult things to kind of cross was definitely, and I got, you know, during my first presentation of version one, I was in Lyon actually at a conference and uh, one ontologist was just like, your ontology is horrible. <laughs> Like it's really, really badly set up. You need to like adhere to more strict data standards. You need to do more mappings. You need to be more clear about whether or not you're cataloging terms or if you're cataloging concepts, because those are two completely different things. And that is still to this day, I think one of the hardest things to really decide. I mean, based on John bringing up the Wikidata example of LGBT, and it has also known as LGBTQ. I mean, you can sit there and you can argue for hours, days, weeks, months, years. Are those, should those actually be also known as, should they be cataloged a different way? Uh, and if so, how? And I really like came to this point where I was like, okay, there really isn't any answer here, but you need to kind of pick one and sort of stick with it. Even so like the way that I did it in mine, was very much, you, I had um, subclasses and individuals or instances. And so if I had, say, for example, a slang term, I was not encoding what the slang term represents, I was encoding the slang term. And so that meant the slang term then became an individual or an instance underneath uh, a class that was LGBTQ slang terms. And so that really helped. I mean, it was definitely very academia in your face of like <laughs> the stinks, but it was very, um, uh, I mean, that's how I learn very well is very much that way. And it, it was it was not, I mean, I'm making this person sound very mean. They weren't mean <laughs> uh, and they genuinely wanted to help and still do help me uh, a lot. And so it's been very nice to kind of have that kind of, um, sort of restructuring. I guess it's not really an aha moment as much as a ah <laughs> moment. Um, but I think those kind of happen a lot. And additionally, getting to meet the Homosaurus board uh, and getting to become a part of that was a huge influence. And of all of my meetings that I have to go to, those are the ones I look forward to the most because I'm getting to work with a lot of incredible people. And so definitely surrounding yourself with people who are um, supportive as much as you are pushing people who might not be supportive to change. Uh, you got to balance those things, I think. Cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with Claire that the Homosaurus meetings are truly a delight. And, you know, I think I think our aha moment for the board, and, and I think this is what you struggle with, with such a domain specific thesaurus is like, what qualifies a concept or a term as being queer enough to be in the Homosaurus? And if you look at the homo source, we have, you know, there are some things that perhaps to somebody outside the queer community, they wouldn't recognize as, you know, would be a queer concept. Um, I don't know, off the top of my head, I'm just thinking like bathhouses, right? Or um, where in gay culture, bathhouses are super important, but outside queer culture, maybe somebody doesn't know. And so having... Uh, having a fantastic group of individuals that, that are members of the queer community and all sort of spectrums of the queer community, we're able to come together and, and have discussion. And, you know, I'm really glad sometimes I have an office with a door because sometimes we talk about very intimate things and it's quite a lot of fun. And, um, and it's, we just can really, we all get along very well. And, and it's these moments of like, okay, yes, like this is part of our community. It might not be part of my slice of the community, but it is part of the queer community and it is welcome and, and is part of the thesaurus. So working with um, a diverse uh, group of people for these projects is essential. Uh, I think uh, uh, I think there are many people, I think many Wikipedians were inspiring uh, for me. And I think from um, Jess Wade, I could cite her name because she has been doing a lot of work in documenting um, the, the the female scientist, and that was a very big moment. And then I heard about LGBT history months in February and October in different countries. Even though I'm far away, even though I'm not in UK, even though I'm not in US, I, I take that opportunity to document things during these two months. And, and something that was very, um, I think very special was when I heard the word BRD, which means be bold, revert and discuss. So it means like if as a contributor, be just be bold, you just add things to the data. And sometimes you make mistakes, 
and you uh, and then it will be some discussion some people will revert it and then you will discuss it and i i didn't know that but uh, i jumped i started documenting and things just went on i think i i just learned about brd recently i should say during the last few working days uh, that's that's my thing. What does the acronym stands for again? Be bold. Uh, revert discuss. I mean, when you are when you're a contributor, you can document some stuff on wiki uh, data. You may you should be bold. You just document it or in on Wikipedia as well. And some people may not agree with you. They will come and revert your contribution. So you feel a bit uh ah uh, such a uh, moment oh and then okay no problem there will be a discussion you could talk about it and resolve the issue so that's how sometimes we the problem with uh I think the community when you are in a collaborative site people has are hesitant to document stuff and I think the BRD philosophy is something that uh, we learned recently as a community as a Wikidata L sorry the Wikimedia LGBT group learned this I learned about this and I think for us that is a very important word. That's cool. Oh, thank you. Let's uh, give a virtual round of applause to our fantastic speakers. Um, the panel was exceptional, so please accept my heartfelt uh, thank you. Uh, that was, I, I, I abuse the word amazing, but that was amazing. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, and so many thanks to our Zoom uh, platform pilot, Sunny Han who's in the middle of the night at the moment, as well as Nishad Talhad for co-organizing the panel and technical support, and also Tom Baker for the support. And a huge thank you to all of you who attended the session. Um, the, thank you for your time and your commitment, and thank you for making this event possible. Please come back on Monday, uh, October 11th at 14 UTC, that's 2 p.m. Universal Time for the second keynote of the conference, Dan Brickley of schema.org. Until then, uh, take care, enjoy the weekend, stay away from COVID and goodbye.